السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. إحنا السراط المستقيم. سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما فلما سلوا وسلم بارم على سيدنا ولا محمد تب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وسهبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Today is the thirteenth of Rabi Lawal. Uh, yesterday was the 12th, which, you know, as we talk, mentioned last week, you know, it's kind of the date that most people celebrate the birth of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm going, we started talking about this last week, and I'm going to continue with it this week, as well as next week and the next week, inshallah. Uh, and we'll have the program on the 14th of November, which will be the 28th of Rabi Al-Awwal. The question, however, before I continue with that, you know, the, one of the questions comes up is, why is this so important? You know, why is how somebody was born important? You know, we're all born. You know, and that statement in itself tells us why it's important. You know, but I'm going to come back to this because this is also directly related to what's going on in France and Europe right now. You know, the significance of the birth of Rasulullah you know, everything that we see happening has a connection with that. Um, you know, it, it's very interesting that you know this country that claims to be leaders in the freedom of expression, you know, is the same country that has banned the niqab. You know, the women, the veil for the women, you know, saying that that's illegal. Yet we, we, we cherish freedom of expression, so that apparently is not an expression for them. Uh, the country that says that, oh, we are leaders in secularism, you know, restrict the rights of Muslims, while they at the same time do not restrict the rights of any other religion. The thing here that we need to understand, and which many of us forget, you know, an enemy that you can see is much easier to deal with than the enemy that you can't see. The enemy on the outside is easier to deal with than the enemy on the inside. And this is what separated the British from the rest of Europe as far as dealing with Muslim countries. You know, if you look at the steps that, you know, and, and even today, you look at what France does, you look at what Denmark does, you know, there's outright, you know, anti-Islamic, you know, belittling Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, doing whatever they can against the Muslims, in every aspect, you know, just outright. You know, and the British realize that, you know, there's no way of dealing with us head on, so what do they do? They go to the Muslim countries and buy off scholars, you know, buy off people, you know, and, 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 and train people, not only buy off people, but also train people and then send them in. Yeah. And say, this is, this, is, this, is, this is the ideology that you need to be spreading. You know, this is the mindset that you need to be spreading. So they have accomplished the same goal you know, without gaining any reaction. You know, because, you know, these so-called scholars, they come and they say, oh, you know, they talk about Rasulullah so like he's anybody else. And then the people say, oh, you know, he's a Muslim. 
He's a scholar. So he must have some credibility. And they basically, you know, control the, the governments. And it's not, you know, I'm saying British, but, you know, British have passed the torch on to others. So it's not just them. You know, and anyone who, 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 who looks at the world understands what I'm saying. <coughs> and if you look at the root of the ideologies that are against Islam, that pose as Islam but are against Islam in reality, you know, the root of those ideologies is that Rasulullah Sallallahu is like us. And we are like him. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's what it means. You know, if, if A plus B equals C, then B plus A also equals C. So to say, oh, he's, he's like us, in reality means that we're like him. And people like me are born every day. So when we look at, you know, the Wahhabi movement, and then the splinters off of the Wahhabi movement, the Deobandis and all the others, various names that they're given in various places, you know, which are actually you know, branches of the Khawarij that existed during the time of Ali. <laughs> if you look at the root of their ideology, this is the root of their ideology. Is that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, oh, see, they used that verse, last verse of Surah Kaha. That say to them that I am a, I am a human like you. Of course, they don't continue the rest of the verse. Yeah. So oh, he, he's like us. You know. If you take the extension of that, the extension of that ideology takes you to Qadiani or the Ahmadiyya or the other names that they're given. That oh, you know, so and so is also a prophet, huh. or so and so is you know. Uh, he, you know, he, he's another prophet. Because again, if if some, if if he's like us and people like me are born every day, then why can't a prophet be born again? Of course, then the same groups that 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 teach or try to push the agenda or the ideology that that takes it, this to the next level are the ones who come against this. Also, oh, no, we're also against this even though we're the ones who gave them all the ammunition to, to create this mindset. You know, this is where, you know, even, you know, we've been talking about Imam Hussein a.s. You know, the grandson of Rasulullah a.s. And, you know, when we look at that story, and it's not a story, when we look at that, that history and that incident, One of the things that we should take from this is that unfortunately those who side with truth don't really understand the, the strength of truth. Yet the enemies of Allah and His Messenger, they understand the strength of, of, of truth. And this is why Yazid, you know, he didn't simply send an army of a thousand men against 72. By the end, after they had stacked up on each other, there were 22,000 against 72. Allah. Because he understood the strength of truth. truth. And he understood the strength of the, of the progeny of Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in the same way, you know, today, when we celebrate the birth of Rasulullah who are the ones from the inside who oppose it the most? The same factions that were created by, or not so created, but, but propped up by the West. You know, the Wahhabis, you know, oh, this is bid'ah, this is an innovation in religion. This will take you to hell. Not just simply, yeah, you know, you can do it, don't do it. No, 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 this is haram, this is forbidden. You cannot do this. Absolutely no. You know, 
in the subcontinent, the Wahhabi is the same thing, the same, same mindset. I mean, the Diobandi is the same mindset. Because they understand the power of this. And yet we don't understand the power of this. You know, this gets back to why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even mention the births of the prophets in, 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 in the Qur'an? You know, in the Qur'an, we're only given the names of 25 prophets. Even though we know from what Rasulullah has taught us and other indirectly through another verse of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he sent a messenger or a prophet to every nation. So we know there are more than 25, and Rasulullah has told us that roughly 124,000 from the time of Adam al Islam to Rasulullah. Mm -hmm. But he only by name, he only mentions 25 in the Quran. And of the 25, he mentions the birth of five. So 20%, which is not an insignificant percentage. And of those. You know, four of them he mentions the birth in detail. Not just one verse in passing, but verse upon verse upon verse about the birth of that prophet. Why? It gets back to that deviation of ideology of, oh, they're like us. If their births, if their births are not like us, then the rest of their lives are not like us. And their passing is not like our death. They are examples for us, but nothing about them is like us. They are way superior, far superior than us. And so that's why falsehood, you know, when we talk about the birth of Rasulullah, so some say, oh, this is bidah, this is haram. And they want to equate that to celebrating Christmas or Easter or Halloween or, or Valentine's Day. And, I, you know, even uh, various so-called imams in their khutbah. You know, it's, it's interesting when, they, when Rabi Lawal comes, they tell you, oh, don't talk about the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi but they themselves want to talk against the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or celebrating the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, like, uh, just recently, uh, the king of Saudi Arabia, he got sick. He's always sick. He's sick in the head. <laughs> so he was sick. And the day he got, you know, when he got better, they put out all these signs and posters. This is the day of Eid for us. Celebration, the king is better. And when we say Eid Milad, you know, celebration of the birth of Rasulullah, so, oh, this is haram. There are only two Eids in Islam. That's what they tell you. Because again, they understand what this leads to. Talking about his birth proves to us that he's not like us. It also proves to us that he is not Allah. And this is the, one of the strongest things that we do of Tawheed. One of the strongest things that we do about the oneness of Allah. And that nothing is like Allah. Because when we talk about the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu we are proving that he is not like Allah. Because Allah has no birth. Which is why in Persian, you know, they refer to Allah as Khuda. Khud, self, ah, come. The one who was by himself. When there was nothing, he was there. And when there will be nothing, he will still be there. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. And here also, when Allah SWT introduces himself, what does he say? Oh, my beloved, you tell them. You introduce me to them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say, He is Allah, the one. Allahus Samad. 
This is a continuation of what now what Rasulullah is telling us of Allah. Allahu Samad. That He is, you know, as Samad, He is uh, without any need. He does not need anything. All of us, we are in need of, of everything. We need the air, we need the food, we need the water, we need social life. Allah is not in need of anything. Because He is the creator of everything. He was when there was no creation. And He will be when there is no creation. And then He will create things again. He will create us again. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. That he does not beget, nor is he begotten. And there is nothing kuf of any equal to him. So when we celebrate the birth of Rasulullah, Allah has no birth. We are proving that he is not Allah, that he is the creation of Allah. But at the same time, because when we talk about the birth and the miracles at his birth, and all, all like we, even we started talking last week, even that is enough to tell us that his birth is not like our birth. So we are not like him. He is not like Allah, and we are not like the Messenger. And yet this is at the foundation of the of the ideology of the Wahhabis that we are like him. You know, I was watching a cartoon. It's supposed to be an Islamic cartoon for children. You know, Mufti Menk is in the cartoon. Yeah. And what is Mufti Menk teaching the children? You know, sort of like, uh, you know, these uh, teaching cartoons, you know, it's what it's supposed to be like. You know, and that, that's not Bidah. Copying the West is not bidda for them. You know, when we do the Sunnah of Rasulullah that is bidda for them. But in, in the cartoon, what's he saying to the children? Oh, Muhammad وسلم, he was a man like us. He was a human being like us. And the children are saying, oh, he was a human being like us. Every other sentence is, he's a human being like us. Which tells me, you know, if, if, you know, if I look at myself, I sin every day. I fall short every day. So if, if I'm driving this thought process into the children, brainwashing them into thinking he's like us, then, oh, you know, he can make a mistake like I can make a mistake. And this is why when we talk about the Mawlid, they have to be so aggressively against it. So that their infiltrators, you know, that are slaves to the West who have come and sat on the pulpits in, in the masajid of the Muslims, can stand up and say, oh, he's like us, we are like him. Don't talk about his birth. Otherwise you might start thinking, maybe he's not like me. This should also tell us why it's important to talk about his birth. To talk about his whole life and every aspect of his life. And even to talk about his passing. Because his passing is not like our passing. You know, if you remember last week we mentioned the, the verses in the Quran in Surah Maryam where Allah Subhanahu wa says about Yahya al-Islam, that peace be upon him the day that he was born, the day that he dies, and the day that he will be raised up again. And Isa al-Islam says that peace be upon me the day that I was born, the day that I will die, and the day that I will be raised up again. For Rasulullah sallallahu he was born in Rabi'ul Awwal. We know Monday, dates are disputed, but again we celebrate it, most of us celebrate it on the 12th. Even though we celebrate it throughout the year and we celebrate it throughout the month. 
in reality. Hmm? When he made Hijrah, when he left Makkah and he entered Medina Munawwara, the day that he entered Medina Munawwara was Friday the 12th of Rabiul Awwal. The hadith is in Sayyid Bukhari. The day that he passed is Monday the 12th of Rabiul Awwal. And again, we're going to come back to the birth aspect. We know that his being born is not like our being born. Mm -hmm. He emigrated from Mecca to Medina. So this is telling us that this is the day Allah SWT has set aside for his enlightenment. He enlightened the world by coming into Mecca. Mm -hmm. He enlightened Mecca and Mecca went from being Mecca to Mecca Mukarrama. Mm -hmm. honored. The honored Mecca. Allah SWT mentions this in the Quran. وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ amin. When he says, you know, the place that you are. And the interesting thing is that this part of the verse applies both to Makkah when Rasulullah was in Makkah. Also applies to Medina Munawar when Rasulullah is in Medina Munawar. He leaves Makkah and he comes to Medina and Medina goes from being Yathrib. You know, Yathrib which was the name of, of the city of Medina. Yathrib means sickness. Because most people would go there and get sick. It mean, and, and the other meaning for it is fighting. Because the people there were fighting all the time. Yet he enters the city and it goes from being Yathrib to Medina Munawara, the, the enlightened city. And when he leaves to go on beyond, you know, he has enlightened the path for us to follow him. And he said this. He said to the Sahaba, he says, I am like a farth for you. I am a farth for you. A farth in Arabic, you know, is you know, like a caravan is traveling or an army is traveling. They would send people ahead. Scouts ahead to go clear the way and also set up the place that we will be camping next. Mm -hmm. This is why when an innocent child dies, the Salatul Janaza is different than anybody else. And in part of the, you know, in the Salatul Janaza for an adult, we say, oh Allah, forgive those who are present and those who are absent and those who are. Uh, alive and those who are dead and those who are big and those who are small and, and or those who are small and those who are big and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the beginning of the dua for, for an innocent child when they die in Salatul Janazah is Allahumma Fartana. Oh Allah, make them a farth for us. Make them someone who will go and clear the path for us to follow, to come. Mm -hmm. Rasulullah is Sayyidul Masumin. He is the master, the leader of all of the innocents. So he says, he says, when I, when I go, I'm leaving you to clear the way for you. To make things ready for your coming to the hereafter. Now the thing, the other interesting point here is the one who goes ahead... His connection from the, with those in, behind is not gone. He is aware of what they're doing and when they will be arriving at their station. So Rasulullah is aware of our condition and also aware of when we will be moving forward. Otherwise, how can he have things ready for us? So this is again the importance of talking about him. The importance of talking about his birth. Because that is the beginning. It shows us right off, you know, right at the beginning that, oh, we're not like him. 
This is the beloved of Allah. This is the one who is loved by Allah. This is the one who is created as the beloved of Allah. And he is Habib Allah. In the last five minutes, and we'll continue next week, inshallah. And as I said, when Rasulullah was born, his mother said what? She said that a light has, was issued forth, and I could see the palaces of Qaisar. Qaisar is the Byzantine king in Sham, thousands of miles away. And yet she's seeing it very clearly. When he's born, and again, even those others who were there, you know, one of them is Umm Shifa, who was the mother of Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahman bin Auf, radiallahu anhu. Thuayba, who was the slave girl maiden of Abu Lahab, the uncle of Rasulullah, who was freed when she gave him the news. Baraka, Ummu Ayman, radiallahu anha. She was originally the slave girl of the father of Rasulullah and then she came into his service. She is the only companion of Rasulullah who was there when he was born and she was there when he passed. He referred to her as his second mother. This is the respect and honor that he had for her. They all said that, again, when he was born, we did not see the child first. We saw a light, and then we saw the physical body of a child. And Umm Shifa, the mother of Abdul Rahman bin Auf, she says that when he was born, I saw him go into prostration. She is the one who this narration is to. She says, I saw him go into prostration. And he, I, I, I put my ears close to him and I heard him saying, Rabbi habli ummati. Oh my Lord, give me my ummah. Give me my nation. Meaning that I will intercede for them. That I may intercede on behalf of them and take them to Jannah with me. You know, we're born, we don't even know Anything. The Rasulullah is born and immediately asking for his ummah. For the forgiveness of his ummah. For our forgiveness. <coughs> and oh, we don't, we don't need to talk about him. You know, it, it amazes me. Uh, that you, know, you have so-called scholars you can listen to and you can listen to them talk for, for an hour. And they never meant once mentioned Rasulullah. There is no Islam without Iman, and there is no Iman without Rasulullah. Faith in a Islam is what? It is simply the love of Allah and His Messenger. You cannot know or love Allah without knowing and loving Rasulullah. <laughs> when the women, those who were there, when they came out, including Umm Shifa and Thu'ayba, they said they saw the donkeys hugging each other. And they heard them saying, I mean, donkey, I mean, why is a donkey going to be hugging each other, another donkey? And how, how can you understand what a donkey is saying? The Rasulullah spoke the language of everything. 
And above that, he spoke the language of the hearts. Well, you have clear-cut narrations where, you know, donkey is, you know, Yafur, Rasulullah Sallallahu donkey. Rasulullah Sallallahu would simply say to him, go and get so-and-so. And Yafur would immediately go. And when the companions saw Yafur coming toward them, they knew, oh, Rasulullah Sallallahu has called me. And they would go. To the extent that if the person was in his house, he would go to that person's house, but his head on the door. They would open the door and say, oh, Yafur, Rasulullah Sallallahu wants me, let me go. Or wherever they were, Yafur would find them. Which also shows us the knowledge of Yafur because he was, he was ridden by Rasulullah. Yafur, if you remember, Yafur was the donkey who was the descendant of the donkey that Isa al Islam, Jesus peace be upon him, rode on. He was the last of that descendant, of those descendants. And he wouldn't allow anybody else to ride on him until Rasulullah Sallam came and the Rasulullah Sallam would ride on him. And Rasulullah Sallam would tell him, go and get so and so, and he would go and he would find them, wherever they were. Which also tells us that he knew where they were. Which Rasulullah Sallam didn't say, go and get so and so from this place. He just said, go and get so and so. So the donkey of Rasulullah Sallam knows the unseen, knows where somebody is hiding or wherever they are, simply because of that connection with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi So what about the knowledge of Rasulullah Sallam himself? And I'll mention what the donkeys were saying next week, inshallah. Uh, so may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala help us understand. Uh, and allow us to talk more and more about His Beloved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And fill our hearts with the true love uh, in our hearts of His Beloved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His family, His companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah, go ahead and make sunnah, inshallah.